I was talking to a student earlier. We had a whole week off from class. That's not bad. It's fine with me. By the way, we have um, one extra lecture this semester. We usually have 28. That's the official, for Tuesday, Thursday classes, you're supposed to have 28 lectures. And we've got 29 this, because I guess they have some day in the semester that's supposed to be off. And uh, so they want to make sure that, I guess the afternoon classes, um, they, they made sure that the afternoon classes on Tuesday, Thursday had 29 uh, lectures. So we get the benefit. So what that means is it takes a little bit of pressure off us, which was nice. Uh, we're actually ahead of pace, uh, even with uh, 29. So there's a strong possibility that you may get another day off, another Thursday off, sometime in November. All right. Now, we already have a, a Thursday off Thanksgiving Day, so that's good. You might get another one if things go good. All right, now, I, I um, vacated lecture last time so that I could finish all your grades. They're, they're done now, um, and I want to go through uh, a full grading example with you. Um, and we're going to do some clicking questions. Um, and it's important because we now have two exams on the books. So this is the way that your, grant, your grades are going to stack out and calculate from now until the final. Now, after the final, we go to the final grade scale out of 250. But right now, we've got officially 150 points on the book. So, you know, so this is a good uh, point uh, to uh, figure things out. All right, so get your clickers ready. I have some clicker questions for you. Let's start the first one. We're on frequency DD. And hopefully these will be easy. How many midterms? Read carefully. Okay, good. <laughs> uh oh. Yep, how many are on schedule for the full semester? Okay, 15 seconds. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 0. Um, now, unfortunately, the, the correct answer is here. I don't know you know, who voted for A and B, but a couple of you did. But 96% of you voted for uh, C. So we've got three exams. Now this is important for us in our grading scheme, and I can't program this into uh, web courses with their grade books, so we, we got to do it all ourselves. But we drop the lowest of the three midterms if you have three midterm exam scores. If you're absent, and I, you know, a few of you may have been absent last Tuesday uh, for exam two, that will become your dropped exam. Same with exam one. If, you've, if you were absent, and a few people were, which happens, um, that will be your dropped exam. That's how we handle um, absentee uh, or absence on exam days. All right. So three. And so we're going to work through this today. Okay. Uh, this whole idea of it dropping exams and stuff. Now, another thing that you've got is your roundup figure. Now, remember how to break that down. It's not like a score. It's um, a numerical code that encodes two scores. How many you've answered correctly and how many you've actually clicked in. So the decimal part, 0.34 here, tells you that you've answered, you know, if this was yours, 
It tells you that you've answered 34 questions. The whole number part tells you that you've answered 22 of them correctly. And both of those figures are significant for your semester grade. Okay. Now, um, you know, because one of them goes, the amount that you get correctly goes into bonus points if you get enough. And we're going to work that out today, too. All right, next clicker question, question two. We got about 20 clicker questions today, so this is, you know, it's a good day to be here and click, click like crazy. If you answer this percentage, you get 25 out of 25 automatically. And hopefully this. Okay, 15 seconds to vote. This one should be like autopilot. Five, ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. Okay. Uh, and let's see the answer. Uh, Ninety percent. This is. This should be a hundred percent. And unfortunately, it's only ninety percent got it right. If you voted for C, you're thinking about the wrong thing. You've got to get this straight in your mind. You know, the, the participation threshold for full participation is not 100%. It's an 85%. And that gives you uh, one or two lectures to burn. So if you're absent, you know, it's not going to start cutting into your grade, um, probably unless you're absent more than two or three times. All right. Now, next question about bonus points. And all this is something that we've talked about many times in class. So you should be able to get this one 100% correct. 15 seconds to vote, starting now. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Okay. Uh, oh, boy. Tell you what, you guys got to get with the, with the program here. Uh, this is the correct answer. 75%. Better make a note of that. You know, the, the data that I give you in the roundup, those two uh, scores encoded there, um, this is the, the whole number part. If that's 75% or more, uh, then you're good. Now, let's do some calculation time. Hit the refresh button on your calculator. And uh, let's do a little cinchy, hopefully, calculation. Uh, hit refresh and let's uh, switch over to numeric answer. And here we go. It's November 31st and you want to calculate your regular participation pointage. The section has had a, a total of 90 clicker questions. How many must you have answered to lock in 25? Now, I want a whole number. Don't give me, you know, something, point, something, something. Give me a whole number. There's only one answer that's correct in mente. All right? And don't forget to hit the send key. And if you type in 103, it's not possible to have a percentage of 90 that's equal to 103, unless you're talking, about, you know, over 100%, but nobody's going to have that. Remember to round off carefully. It's got to be a whole number. If you don't round off carefully, you're not going to make 85%. You're going to make something else. Okay. Uh, 15 seconds to vote starting now. 
10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5. I'll give you another 30 seconds. Because I can see you guys are still clicking stuff in. Hurry up. No, don't type in 0.85. That's not right. That's the percentage. That's not the number of dineros. Oh, you want a whole number. Come on. Think. Fifteen seconds starting right now. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. Uh, yeah, you guys did good. Uh, Ninety-five percent of you got the correct answer. Seventy-seven. All right. If you type, a couple of you typed in seventy-six, you ran it off wrong. All right. Because you want to, the 76 point something gets you exactly to 85%. The problem with that is 76.0 does not. That's below 85%. All right. All right, so that's just a little bit of a warm up. Let's go through the grades and let's try to put together a grade estimate. I'll show you how it works. And you've got everything inside the grades page now that you need to do this yourself. So let's, let's just kind of trot through this. Okay, so you've got two midterms right now, all right? Midterm, most of you do, anyways. Okay, so they're 50 points each, 100 points possible. Okay, and, but that, that's all we've got. We only have two, so nothing's been dropped yet. Now, if you, with the exception of the fact that if, if you've missed an exam, then that's going to be your dropped exam. But other, for the people that have been here for both, we haven't dropped anything yet. Okay, and that's because exam three is not on the books yet. Uh, so, so what? So keep working hard because the grade that you, the grade status that you have now, and I've done grades for everybody, and there's some nice grades coming up. People are bringing their grades up nicely. Um, just keep working hard. Crush exam three. I saw a student that you know they got taken for a loop on exam one, but they put a good beat down on. Exam two. Exam two was uh, a tough exam. By the way, some students were asking me about the average, just less than 70%, a little bit less than that. So it's a little tougher. The exam one was a little bit above. I try to shoot for 70%, okay? And sometimes a little bit low, sometimes a little bit above. So we're doing good, but that was a tough test. It, nobody aced it. Uh, so the, the highest grade was like 90 something percent, but not 100%. So which is all right, you'll, you'll be, you know, just keep working hard and stay with me. Okay, Steve? All right, keep working your, you know, working it and, and, you know, maybe try, listen to your classmates or your, make friends with somebody, figure out how they studied to prepare differently for exam two, if they crushed it. All right, now, for us guys, in this section, we've got 39. Now, the other section has got a different number slightly, so we're going to have to try to get those guys caught up today. Okay, but for us, 39 questions. So that means that the 85% level is 34 questions or more answered. All right? And if you're below 34 answered, which some of you are, you've got to use the proportion. Now that's this baby up here. Okay, so you type in your number or you put in your, your, the number of answers you have divided by 39 and then divide that by 0.85. Or anyways, work out this um, proportion, whichever way you like to do proportions. Yeah, you know, cross multiply and all that stuff. All right. And so you've got to do that if you're below 34 on the answers. So that's the decimal part of the roundup number. Okay. Now the 75% bonus level is 30 or more correct. So that's the whole number part, Casey, of the roundup figure. All right. So you can look those up uh, in your grades page. Uh, 
and figure that out. Now, total homework pointage, uh, excuse me, total homework uh, score is 197. Now, that's taken into account all the mini reviews in Great River, which are now up, except for those of you that have not put in your NID. Now, some of you guys have got zeros there or minus ones. Uh, because you haven't even registered in Great River, you're going to be missing a bigger and bigger chunk of points as we go through the semester. Okay, but for those of you that have done everything, it's 197. And you just do a straight percentage. So multiply by 25 and then round up, and that'll get you your, you know, your, your homework pointage. So, uh, so it's just, you know, this. Okay, and... Uh, and so you got a, a bindle of 25 for participation, and you got a, a bindle of 25 possibly for homework. So the total right now is 150 points. All right. And uh, so the, the, if you want to estimate your grade, you have to go by a baseline or a basis number of 150. All right now, for those of you that have taken exam one but not exam two, or you've taken exam two but not exam one, you're on a different basis because you don't have that second exam. You're on a basis of 100. But for almost everybody, it's 150 points. Another thing, the participation is going to get closer to 100 asked, and the homework is probably going to be up towards 400. All right, so we got a lot of, you know, dineros coming down the line. So... Things can change nicely. Okay, now here's, here's the grading estimate scale right now until the final exam is on the books. If you have 135 or more right now, and that includes bonus points. If you have one or two, you add those in to the numerator. Uh, you've got an A. 113 or more, you've got a B. For now, uh, that can go down or up depending on how you do between now and Thanksgiving, now and the beginning of December. Uh, C is 90 points, D is 75 points, uh, and uh, below 75 is an F. And there's a few, God bless you, you you're down there in the Fs. But, um, but this is for people that are uh, at 150 total points. This is for people that have had both exams, which most of you have. Okay, so don't forget to include any bonus points. And you can put, put all that together with the stuff that we can now view in web courses. Okay, so the homework and clicker pointage and total points as of, two, as of October 16th, the exam, exam two last week, uh, is now published for you. It looks something like this. Now, I want to make a note uh, to you. Um, this top, very top line, it says basis right there. And in this particular sample student, their basis is 150. Now, if you have a, one exam that you didn't take, your basis number here is going to be 100. Right? So that means things are going to look a little different for you. And you'll go to discussions and uh, figure this out. Now, um, the total points I've got set over here at 150 for everybody. But if you missed an exam, go by the basis number, okay? And the fact that I can't change this automatically for you, in other words, whatever you have in the basis cell of your gradebook can't be automatically transferred uh, over here to this column. A, great, a canvas won't permit me to do that. Um, so that's why I'm publishing this number separately up here for the, for the dozen or so of you that have, have got a, a missing exam. And just so you know, you know, students are frequently ask me, well, Dr. B, when are you going to turn on the percentages and the grades and stuff in the gradebook and canvas? This is why. Because I can't put up this kind of information 
in the grades page that I want you to have, Canvas doesn't care. They don't care what, you know. They just add things up willy-nilly. But if I put stuff in there for everybody to see with their grades, like basis, it's going to throw all the percentages off, you know, that Canvas provides. So I just turn off those Canvas percentages and stuff like that. And that's why they're, they're not activated for you guys. And it's, it's nice now. Used to be you couldn't turn those off. And now we can do that. All right. Now, I have a comment for you about the, or a set of comments about the rest of the semester. Actually, let's go back here. Um, any questions about the grades situation? Because I'm going to turn away from grades now. Question? Casey. When will the next time we get an update for the SAT tuition and not getting any grades? Total points. Well, this number over here, total points, the basis number is 150 now until December when we put the final in. But you'll be able to calculate this, you know, as soon as Thursday. I mean, because when we have, you're going to have some homework tonight. You know, do Thursday. And so that'll mean your homework points are going to change slightly. So you might have, you know, you know, if you have 24 now, you might have 25 on Thursday. So, uh, but mentally you'll be able to calculate it. I probably won't do anything um, until maybe after exam three. Okay. Now I'll, I'll do it for everybody probably one more time after exam three. So that'll be Thanksgiving Day weekend. So I might do that. And that... Then we have another week of classes, and then we have finals. So that'll be a pretty good estimate going into the finals. All right, but you can do this every, you know, every time. You know, so every time, you know, take, your, take whatever you do today clicking-wise, and that's going to possibly change your – I mean, unless you're already, you know, 30, 39 out of 39, you're, you're going to have to start unclicking to get something less than 25 out of 25. But uh, – but, I mean, theoretically, yeah, you can do it any time. And I'll probably do it again like this uh, after exam three. Because that's when the big, because that's when we drop the, you know, the two out, you know, drop the worst, keep the best two out of three. So, all right, let's talk about the rest of the semester. Here's the basic schedule. So, this is the middle of the week that we meet, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Wednesday office hours. Um, and the red check mark sh shows you where we are today, lecture 19, lecture 20 on Thursday. And you can see we go all the way out to lecture 29 on November 29. Uh, in yellow, that's uh, lecture 27. It won't be a lecture. It'll be an exam. The yellow uh, uh, rectangle, that's November 20th, as per the syllabus. And for us guys, oh, my goodness. December 6, 7 a.m. You know, I wish we could get, like, Starbucks to cater the final. You know, you know, have a bunch of, you know, like one of these big canisters of coffee and maybe some treats or something. But they can't make any money off you guys, so I'm sure. maybe I'll ask them. It sure would be an act of kindness, though, I'll tell you what. Although, you know, outside, outside the lecture hall, there's all kinds of signs that say, do not bring food and drink, <laughs> which I guess I'm a bad boy uh, for that. Uh, anyway, so uh, that's our uh, situation. Um, and mega office hours uh, during exam. You know, the bottom row, Danielle, is going to be uh, mega. Is, that's the bottom row is exam week. So we'll have a mega office hours. So in other words, I'll be there most of the day that Wednesday. If, you know, if I haven't been driven crazy by the section two, they go on Tuesday. Their, their exam is over here. But these guys, 7 a.m., and I promise I will not narc on anybody if you bring 
a cup of coffee or a monster into the lecture hall because 7 a.m. is brutal. By the way, the exam traditionally in my class is double the size of a midterm, okay? And, but on final exam day, you have basically three hours to do it, so that's kind of nice. So three, three times the amount of time, but double the amount of work. So you're still going to, you know, some of you will still be here for the, for the last bitter end minute, but uh, that's all right. Okay, questions about this schedule. Keep your clickers out because we're going to keep clicking. We've got a bunch of clicker questions to do. By the way, if you look at the schedule, we take exam three on the 20th, and then bam, we have the rest of the week off, at least from this class, because Thursday is Thanksgiving Day, so we don't have to come to classes, which is nice. Okay, um, I want to review this topic um, if you've downloaded the ebook that I, the little tiny EPUB that I made calculations, you'll know that there's a set of standard brain burners that, that I like to teach every semester. Uh, for instance, stopping time is one of them. Stopping distance, um, which we just, you know, we finished with both of those. Um, freefall table of energies, calculating the downward speed. Uh, that's also a good one. And I don't think we had that on this exam, uh, but uh, we still have the final ahead, you know, so you never know. Now, another standard brain burner that is a challenge to students uh, every semester is the heat melt heat problem, which we're going to tackle today. And then um, along with that is the thermal equilibrium temperature problem which is a little bit it's not tricky but it it requires different uh, methods of calculation so it's it's kind of a brain burner then um, after that we'll be talking about the electromagnetic interaction the Coulomb interaction um, and we'll be talking about the interaction of protons and electrons because we're heading towards an understanding of the periodic table, molecules and atoms, and uh, substances um, that are all encoded in the periodic table. Um, we're also going to be talking about electrons as waves, uh, and that's also uh, kind of a novel, it's not a hard calculation, but it's still a lot to think about. So, uh, and there's a couple more that will be... And if we have time, we might talk about, um, you know, volcanoes or something like that. So, uh, because that's good. To, volcanoes and stuff, that is good to talk about after a periodic table. So, uh, one last thing I want to uh, cover with you uh, from Chapter 5, uh, in the angular momentum uh, chapter, is the idea of a phase diagram. So, this is our new material starting today. Um, the phase diagram is a, a, an abstract diagram. So what you do is you map out the position of an object on the horizontal axis. So like it's x-coordinate, which is what I've got up here. And then you map out on the vertical axis, you map out its momentum. Right? Now this is completely abstract. You can't take a, you know, if something's in periodic motion, you know, like circular motion, it'll form an ellipse or a circle, you know, depending on your scales, your graph paper, like the one I've got here. But you can't take a photograph of it. Just like with distance triangles, the velocity graph, you can't take a photograph of it. You can think about it, and from that you can make, make an XY graph paper plot, same thing with this, uh, but this in itself, you can't photograph. It's not. It's something called phase space. And for which, in this example, the coordinates are x and the momentum coordinate that goes along with x, so p subscript x. You know, so 
you know, left and right, x coordinate, and then how much momentum, kg meter per second, do you have to the left, or negative kg meter per second to the left, or to, yeah, to the left. And so positive to the right, negative to the left. Um, and so, but, you know, the left word in this diagram is, is the, the lower half of the graph. And right word is the upper half. So that's a little bit like the velocity graph, except the horizontal axis here is a position. It's a, it's a, uh, a spatial coordinate, not temporal like the velocity graph. Okay. Now, this, as I mentioned, this thing is completely abstract. All right. But it is very, very handy, especially when we get into the periodic table. This is going to be our doorway to understand the periodic table. Uh, because in phase space, uh, the motion is, uh, especially for a periodic object, so something that's orbiting the nucleus, you know, something that's um, oscillating back and forth like electromagnetic radiation, it's going to form um, some kind of an ellipse like what we've got here. The area of the ellipse has an area interpretation. Now look, here's, so the length time, remember, you know, in the velocity graph, length times width gave us a distance. In this one, we've got, you know, each pixel has a length and a width, but horizontally, the width is in meters, because that's the horizontal axis. But the height is in uh, momentum, kilogram meter per second. All right. So this thing has got a different, different, different. We got kilograms in there, and we got meters, both axes, and we got per second in the vertical axis. So we got a whole smorgasbord here, but it turns out that it's kind of cool. So let's take a look at this uh, diagram. So here's, here's a blow up of it. Go ahead and make yourself a nice one. P subscript X on the vertical, X coordinate on the horizontal. And so if you have something in periodic motion, it's going to go, you know, circular or anything else, you know, like a, a spring buzzing back and forth, or even um, a sound wave, you know, that causes oscillations like the voice that you're listening to right now. Okay, those sound waves oscillate, they're pressure variations that go through the air to your ears. But they're going to have a certain um, you know, if it's a physical motion, it's going to have a certain position to the left, all right, X subscript L, and a certain maximum rightward motion over here, X subscript R, okay? So the, so the limit of like any kind of an orbit, you know, a bound motion is going to have an XL and an XR left and right on this axis somewhere, okay? All right, so um, then if you think about it, you know, like in a comet going around the sun, it has maximum kinetic energy, maximum momentum down by the um, perihelion and minimum out at aphelion. So there's going to be a maximum um, momentum to the right, and this is rightward momentum. In, you know, in this example. And then, so you draw in the line up there, and then draw in a line down here, and your, your ellipse fits into this box. Um, and then here's the maximum leftward momentum. Now, this is completely abstract. It is not a snapshot. So you, it, it looks like, you know, something, you know, like a comet. I mean, a comet will go through an elliptical orbit around the sun. But this, that's, that's on the XY plane, the XY graph paper of the solar system. That's nice, but that's not what this is. This is a phase diagram, completely abstract. You know who else uses uh, phase diagrams? Uh, cardiologists. They look at your heart. You know, if you, my, you know, my little sister, she's an electrocardiologist, and it's one of the tools that they use. They look at your, you know, your EKG and they make a phase diagram out of it. And apparently, and I'm going to give you a little lecture on Thursday about this, 
that if you have like a heart condition, you know, like if your mitral valve is blooped up or something, it'll show on the phase diagram. You know, if you have defibrillation, it'll show in the phase diagram. But if you have a good sinus rhythm, it's going to look like this. You know, when they get it all tuned in right, stuff like this, it's kind of cool. Now, as I mentioned, the area on this abstract mapping represents a dynamical quantity. Just as area under the graph, between the velocity graph and the time axis represented a distance, the area of this, especially a bound uh, orbit, a bound orbit in phase space means, you know, it might not be an ellipse, it might be kind of a more of a, you know, Indianapolis 300, or it could be Daytona, you know, that's like a weird, it's not an oval, it's not an ellipse, but it's got a bunch of circles. It's going to be closed, you know, perfect periodic motion is going to look like an ellipse. But what is the area of this thing? What are the units? What quantity? Length and width. Height and width. One half height times width. Diamond? Re stretching? Okay, sorry. Yeah. Width is uh, meters. Width is meters. The height is kilogram meter per second, momentum. So what's meters times kilogram meter per second? Meters times kilogram meters per second. Where have we seen that before? Huh? A joule? No, it's not a joule. But good, you're, you're, you're thinking the right direction. It's something. A meter times a kilogram meter per second. Where have we seen that before? No, not a Newton. What do you think? Yeah, it would be kilogram meters. Yeah, it's kilogram meters squared per second. So where have we seen that before? Kilogram meters squared per second. Where have you roamed? Kilogram meters squared per second is not a Newton either. Kilogram meters squared per second. No, Newton meter is a joule. Joule is kilogram meter squared per second squared. This is different. But you know, good, you're thinking. Good. Kilogram meter squared per second. Call it. No. Inertia is kilogram meter squared. Kilogram meter squared per second. Angular momentum. La, 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 la. Lauren scores. Ding. So three points. She scores from three-point land. And so, the, you know, the area of this baby, and you may think, big deal, Dr. B. But you know what else? You can get an oscillation frequency. I mean, if it's in circular motion or something, some kind of bound orbit, it's going to have, you know, a lap time, you know, period. It's periodic. And one over that is the frequency. So you're going to get some kind of an omega out of this diagram. It's pretty sweet. And, and actually, as I've mentioned before, this is going to help us tackle the periodic table. Connor. you're using the same unit as angular momentum. And actually, angular momentum is involved with atoms and stuff. But it's even bigger than that. So, so really, you should say it's the same as angular momentum. It's also the same as Planck's constant, H, the mysterious constant of nature that rules them all. And uh, Max Planck, this, that's the, this Max Planck, this 
this guy with the, the big mustache. He developed this constant that rules in the quantum world of atoms and molecules, photons and electrons. He developed it when he was studying heat. And so let's talk about heat. Chapter 6. So we're going to talk about heat now, and then we're going to talk about oscillation, and then the electromagnetic interaction, and then the periodic table by the end of the semester. So, And Max Planck, he's waiting for us. He's down there encoded into the periodic table with his Planck's constant. And he's just saying, all right, let's go. Let's go. Now, here's an English chap, James Prescott Jewell. He's the one that really got things going and got things organized in the 1800s. Um, and he figured out that there's an equivalence between energy, kinetic energy, and temperature. So what he did was he took this device here, and this is kind of an idealized view of it. He took a bucket of water, and he had some paddle wheels on it, and they were connected to some pulleys, and the, the other end of the pulley, you know, so one end is connected up to the paddle wheels in the bucket of water, and he's got a thermometer in there measuring the temperature. And the other end of the pulley system is a weight. You know, so he's got some mg. And he lets the weight drop, you know, 50 centimeters or whatever he wanted. And that gives some kinetic, and all that mgh goes into the kinetic energy of the paddle wheels. Right? And what he noticed was that the kinetic energy of the paddle wheels um, correlated directly to the temperature. Okay? Now, this is mentioned in the Kinetic Theory of Matter, chapter 6.3, the following. Um, and because of that, we have an understanding um, of thermal equilibrium and why, you know, two, you know, like if you take a, a glass of water and an ice cube, and if the glass of water is, a, you know, a fair, you know, like room temperature, it'll melt the ice. But if you have a lot of ice, it won't melt all the ice, you know, depending on how much water and, and ice you put in there. So uh, that whole idea of thermal equilibrium, and we'll, we'll try to tackle that on Thursday, you know, so... Uh, so, and that's the issue of heat transport. And the, the kinetic theory of matter applied to the idea of heat energy propagating from one substance to a, a piece of another substance, or from one end of a block of ice to the interior of the block of ice. Another thing that we're going to uh, talk about is how different, and this is actually what we're going to talk about today, how different elements and molecules cool off and heat up differently. All right. And so, for instance, phases of matter. You know, water uh, freezes at a different point than ammonia. And hydrogen becomes liquid at a different, hydrogen gas becomes a liquid at a different temperature than uh, oxygen. Okay. And they're both pretty, they have, both have to go really cold. It's cryogenic. But, you know, different substances have different freezing points and different melting points and stuff like that, uh, different boiling points. So the boiling point of hydrogen is way below room temperature because hydrogen in, you know, like this room would be gash. It would, you know, if you had a little bit of liquid hydrogen, it would instantly become gaseous because it's so hot in here relative to hydrogen. Now, to understand all that, all of this stuff, Kinetic energy correlating to temperature, uh, thermal equilibrium, and phases of matter and how they heat up and stuff, melting points and stuff, we have to introduce the Kelvin temperature scale. Right now, here's a picture of William Thompson, Lord Kelvin. Another guy with a big mustache. And actually, uh, James Prescott Jewell had a big mustache and a beard, James Harden-like beard. So... Pretty cool. But anyways, uh, let me go back through here. Um, so here's Thompson. 
uh, Lord Kelvin. And you know, you know, he became a lord, you know, that in England, you know, you do something great for the empire, you become a knight or maybe a lord or a lady um, and uh, or a, a, a dame. Um, and he was really smart, but he figured out how to lay, how to get cables to transmit telegraph from America to the United Kingdom, to, to Britain. In other words, the transatlantic cables and, uh, and a bunch of other stuff. He figured out how to demat, you know, a steel warship. You know, in his day, they were starting to build warships made of steel. The problem was that they got magnetized in the shipyard by the magnetic field of the earth. And so when that happened, you couldn't use a compass until this until uh, Kelvin figured out how to defeat that so and he also has a temperature scale named after him and it's based on Celsius so it's like a metric scale but it's based on a different baseline temperature so for you know for Celsius the zero point is the freezing point of water all right but not for for the Kelvin scale the Kelvin scale the, it's, the, the zero point is called absolute zero. This is also called the absolute temperature scale, but I usually call it the Kelvin scale. Okay, and you know, the informal or colloquial way of describing absolute zero is, you know, where all molecular motion stops. You know, and we, we've got this gas that we're breathing, the atmosphere, right? And the atoms and molecules, uh, the, you know, the molecules of, oxygen and nitrogen, CO2 that we're breathing in and out. Um, they're zipping around all different velocities, all different directions. And it's a gas, it's chaotic. It's just completely unorganized. You know, but we you know our bodies can handle it in our lungs and stuff like that. But as you cool it down, the, the uh, molecules of oxygen will eventually form a liquid. Then that means that they've bo uh, bonded to each other slightly and then you can freeze it solid oxygen or metallic oxygen that's even stronger bonds at an even deeper temperature same thing with hydrogen it's very difficult to do with hydrogen but uh, you can do it and at that point you would think that you know molecules they're in a crystal they're done they're they're stuck and you know, not you know if it's a crystal you know uh, and so that's, so that's the idealization um, in 1800s terminology. But now the modern way is to say that because we think of electrons as waves and they're never going to stop waving, even electrons bound to an atom. Um, but we would say that the absolute zero is the temperature from which you can never extract more heat, uh, more work. You know, a thermal engine, you know, like the, uh, you know, the boiler in a Mississippi steamboat going up and down the Mississippi. Or, you know, the Titanic, you know, those big boilers and the guys shoveling the coal in. You know, any kind of ocean-going vessel with boilers and stuff, um, those are thermal engines, and they basically get thermal energy to, to do work on a turbine. You know, the turbine moves, and then that generates an a, a gen, uh, electrical power, or it turns the, the uh, propellers on the boat, the screw, you know, all, all different kinds of things. And so th the precise way of describing absolute zero is the temperature from which no work can be extracted. And theoretically, it is not possible to physically uh, get to um, absolute zero because our way of lowering the temperature is to extract work, even small amounts of work, by the cooling process. So you can get down to 0 0.01 Kelvin. We know how to do that. We know how to get to 0 0.001 Kelvin. And extract a little bit more energy. You know, there's ways to do it, you know, cooling stuff off. Just like your refrigerator, it just doesn't, it doesn't, your refrigerator doesn't have to go down to absolute zero, but I mean, it's a refrigeration process, cooling process. 
And, but theoretically, you can never cool something down because the, the cooling process is a way of extracting energy. And if you ever notice on your refrigerator, if you listen to it, there, there's always a, you know, like a port in the refrigerator, you know, in the back or down at the bottom where warm air comes out. Okay, that's waste energy from the, so that's what, you know, it's extracting the, you know, you put in a, you know, a bottle of water like this, room temperature, and it has heat energy in it. And the cooling system extracts energy from this bottle of water and exhausts it out the bottom of the refrigerator. Now, when you can't do that anymore, your, your, your um, system doesn't extract any more work. And that's the absolute zero point. So here's the scoop. Um, that zero point on the Kelvin scale corresponds to minus 273 on the Celsius scale. So that means zero Kelvins, absolute zero, is minus 273 Celsius. And I think it's like 300 and something Fahrenheit, negative 300 or something Fahrenheit, or negative 400 or something. Well, you know what, guys? We're not going to use Fahrenheit at all. I mean, we'll talk about it like a little bit today, but... And we're not going to use Celsius very much at all, except to do a little conversion, you know, so you know the basics. And here's another little conversion. 273 Kelvin is zero degrees Celsius. So the freezing point of H2O is 273 Kelvins. And you don't say Kelvin degrees, you just say Kelvins. Okay, because it's an absolute scale. It's not, a it's not really a degree scale, right? Now, the boiling point of water, 100 degrees Celsius to 12 Fahrenheit, uh, is 373. So it's the same number of Kelvins, 100, between freezing and boiling of water. Just as in the Celsius scale, there's 100 Celsius degrees from 0 to 100. That's how they define the Celsius scale, 100 degrees. The metric system, 100 degrees. The Fahrenheit system, 180 degrees, a little bit smaller. All right. Now, let's do a little simple work out here with your clickers. Here we go. And uh, do a refresh. Sorry, I didn't put a, uh, because this is a multiple choice. All right. Room temperature Celsius considered to be 20 degrees Celsius in the Kelvin scale. Twenty seconds to vote. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Very good. Uh yeah, pretty good. Two ninety three. Um just add two seventy three. You know, so whatever Celsius is at 273. Okay, so body temperature, 96.8 Fahrenheit. I forget what that is. I think it's like 310 or something like that. Uh, you can calculate it. It's not hard. All right, next question. An advantage to the Kelvin scale. Read this one carefully and think. The answer to this one, you should put this in your notes too, because the answer to this is really the 
the reason that scientists prefer to use the Kelvin scale, like in astrophysics where my research area is, we're always talking Kelvin scale. We don't, you know, we don't really talk about Celsius or Fahrenheit. I mean, you know, 100 years ago they might have, but not anymore. You do everything in, in Kelvins. But like the weather, you know, the, the, the guys on the weather channel, they're, they're Fahrenheit and Celsius, you know. But, okay, 10 seconds to vote. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 0. Okay, pretty good. 60% um, of you got this correct. Um, the answer is A. 24% uh, of you voted for B. Always multiplies out to absolute zero. No, that's, that's uh, gibberish. C, uh, 15 of you voted for C. When calculating the temperature, the Kelvin is easier because it's larger than the Celsius degree. That is dead wrong. The size of a Kelvin is the size of a Celsius degree. Because remember, between boiling point and, and freezing point, there's 100 Kelvins and there's 100 Celsius degrees. So, so all you got to do is add. You don't have to multiply. You know, like when you're going from Celsius to Fahrenheit, you got to multiply by 9 fifths or divide by 5 ninths and all kind of nonsense like that. But Celsius to Kelvin, it's either add or subtract 273. 273.15 if you want to be fussy about it. So positive temperatures only, here's the, the bottom line for this question. It's a useful property because kinetic energy is also positive and therefore average kinetic energy is also a positive number at any time. And that is what the temperature, the Kelvin temperature of an object is direct, or, or excuse, of a sample of gas or anything else it's directly proportional to the average kinetic energy. Right? So the temperature of this gas in here, uh, the, the atmosphere that we're breathing in and out, is proportional to the average kinetic energy of a single molecule. So Now, I want to give you some more about heat phenomena, specifically color and temperature. And this, again, is getting close to uh, Max Planck. For instance, you know, the, the idea that something can be red hot, yeah, we, we actually look at stars. You know, this is a, a red supergiant in the constellation Orion. Constellation Orion, this is the right shoulder of Orion, Betelgeuse. And it's a red supergiant, and we can see that it's red. That tells us that, you know, its surface temperature at least is, you know, a certain range in Kelvin. See these white spots here? This is actually in infrared. Those are, those are really bright in infrared, which indicates slightly cooler. So those are like, and th that's actually one of the few stars that we can actually make out anything on the surface. Most stars, you know, we just see a point of light. We don't see, you know, a blob of light. But the, Betelgeuse is big enough and close enough we can actually make out those two white, those two big white spots. Uh, those are like sunspots, really big sunspots on the surface of uh, Betelgeuse. So yeah, red. And then here's another star cluster. Blue stars are hotter, you know, blue hot. This is the cluster called M13. And if you look at it, yeah, this, this screen is pretty good. This projector shows you a lot of blue. You look at it on YouTube, you'll see even more of the bluishness. And so those, you know, the bigger stars are usually hotter because uh, they're burning hydrogen in the core a little bit more per second. So the outer surface is a little bit hotter. And our sun's kind of in the middle. It's kind of a yellowish green star. Here's the, here's the upper atmosphere of our sun. This is a picture mm, about lunchtime yesterday. It's a false color ultraviolet image. So all the bright spots here are at about a temperature of, oh, the blue is at about a temperature of a million Kelvin. Now, that's the upper atmosphere. 
the, the surface that we see, you know, this is ultraviolet. We don't see this. So that's why it's a false color. The surface that we see, what's called the photosphere of the sun, is um, at about 5,800 Kelvin. And this, uh, a wavelength of 17.1 nanometers, that's associated with a temperature of 1 million Kelvin, uh, we don't know why it happens. In the atmosphere of the sun, you know, way out there in the atmosphere, you know, where all those, you know, those big swirly loops and, you know, co uh, uh, coronal ejections and stuff happen. Uh, we don't know why it's so hot. It's million, you know, you know, the entire upper atmosphere is millions of kelvins. We, we're trying to figure it out. You know, it has to do something with the magnetic fields, the, the sunspots. Sunspots are magnetic fields. Coronal mass ejections happen because of magnetic fields. All kind of, you know, the big loops that you see blooping out of the sun. Uh, those are, uh, you know, magnetic field. But we don't ex know exactly how it works. It's very tricky. But guys are working on it. So yeah, color and temperature uh, correlate. And that's going to be significant for us for the rest of the semester. You know, red, you know, f so infrared cooler, red, a little bit hotter, green, a little bit hotter than that, blue and violet, a little bit hotter than that, ultraviolet, even hotter than that, okay? So you could theoretically heat something up, heat up a piece of metal in the camp, well, you probably couldn't do it in a campfire, but if you had a forge, you know, like, uh, you know, where like a, a, a blacksmith has, you can heat stuff up to white hot and probably get a lot of ultraviolet off those babies, depending on what you're heating up. So it's, it's uh, and it goes all the way up to x-rays, all the way down to microwave and infrared, microwave and radio waves. You know, the, that's the coolest, coolest color. Now let's get down to the nitty gritty of heating and cooling. So now we're gonna talk about, as I said, why do certain molecules and atoms in mass um, heat up and cool off differently and at different and why do they freeze at different temperatures well, let's get down to the business let's start with water liquid water the metric system temperature wise is based on the behavior thermal behavior of liquid water All right so one calorie of energy so this introduces the energy unit the other metric energy unit the calorie it raises one gram of liquid H2O by one Kelvin in Paris at certain, you know, atmospheric pressure and stuff like that. But basically it's one gram of liquid water. So this, this bottle of water, this is 500 milliliters. Okay, so that's 500 grams of water. So I would need 500 calories to raise the temperature of this by one Kelvin, one Celsius degree, all right? And that defines something we call the specific heat. And it, it could be um, a calorie from sunlight or any other, you know, like just holding it between my hands. You know, my hands are at 98.6 Fahrenheit, so they're gonna heat up this water if I hold it for an hour, but I'm not gonna do that. You know, so, so this defines for us something called the specific heat. Uh, of liquid water. It's one calorie per gram per Kelvin. And every substance has a specific heat. You know, so gold has a little bit different specific heat, a little bit less, well, quite a bit less. Uh, frozen water. And here's how we would, here's how we would write it. This the customary symbol is lowercase c for specific heat. And I usually write it this way, 1.0 calorie per gram Kelvin. So that means for every gram of liquid water that you've got, if you want to raise it up by one Kelvin, you got to have 1.00 calories. You know, that you beam in by solar radiation or, or you know, with a flame or any other heat source. You know, you've got to have a calorie. of, And, and, that, and basically this also defines the calorie. You know, the joule is based on... Um, the kilogram, the standard kilogram, which is a, a, a hunk of steel or something, 
in Paris, France. The meter, which is another hunk of steel or silver palladium alloy or something like that in Paris, France. And the second, which is a fraction of a day. But this is, based, is a metric unit based on water. So, and a lot of things are, are based on water. Now, solid water, i.e. ice, below 32 Fahrenheit, 0 Celsius, 273 or below Kelvin, um, has a specific heat of 0 0.50 calories per Kelvin, per gram Kelvin. All right, so this one's a little bit... Let me ask you, which one is easier, gram for gram, to heat up by one Kelvin? Ice or liquid? Which one's easier? Ice is, because it only takes half a cal calorie. All right, so make a note of that. If your specific heat is small, that means it's gram for gram, it's easier to bring it up by a Kelvin. Okay, hopefully that makes sense to you. And that's what specific heat um, tells us. Now there's a whole lot of quantum mechanics behind that number. If you wanted to calculate it from first principles, which Einstein was able to do, uh, I think he was the first one, uh, and we, we try to do it now, you, you know, there's a whole lot of quantum mechanics and physics in there, calculus and stuff, but you know, we can me measure specific heats fairly easily. For most stuff, I mean, it's, if you have something like metallic hydrogen, which is extremely difficult to get metallic, you have to have uh, certain pressures and temperatures, really tough. Kind of like dry ice. Dry ice, we can't, you know, you've never seen liquid CO2. You see liquid water all the time. You see solid water all the time. And you can't see water vapor because it's invisible, but you see the results of water vapor every time you see a, th a, a thundercloud, thunder, any kind of cloud up in the sky. You know, the water vapor rises up there and then it forms little teeny droplets at a certain atmospheric pressure up there at you know, 10,000 feet. It starts making water droplets and they're so small they, they just stay suspended by the air currents of everything else that's floating upward and that's a cloud. So what's the difference between the liquid phase of H2O and the, the solid phase. Well, the difference is that you're, you have uh, crystalline bonding for ice. And you don't have crystalline bonding for water. You have a very weak liquid bond. It's, hy it's hydrogen bonding, we call it. And it's pretty weak. But liquid is, does bond because... Liquid forms droplets. That's what holds droplets together. It's pretty weak. It doesn't, it's not cold enough to form a crystal, but it's still, you know, you can still form a little bit of cohesion to form uh, a droplet. So different average kinetic energies, i.e. the temperature. You're either above 273 Kelvin or you're below it if you're ice. Um, and that means you've got crystalline bonds below 273 Kelvin, and above that, you don't. And this is, now we're getting into the intermolecular forces, which are electrical. So electrical potential energy enters here. Now, we don't have that technology in place yet. It's a couple chapters ahead. But, you know, we, we know about potential energy, and it's electrical, so an electrical is a force, so. We'll get to it. We'll get to electrical potential energy in a week or two. Uh, and those, those crystalline bonds that ice has but liquid water does not have, they represent a lot of stored energy, a lot of potential energy. All right? And water, for you know, whatever reason, is one of the substances with the big, a really big specific heat. In other words, to go from, from solid to liquid takes, and from liquid to solid, takes a lot of energy to do, right? 
So other substances you can look up in a table. Now, to go from solid, so, so here's something I want to emphasize to you. You can jot this down in your notes, it's not on the slide. Solid water and liquid water can coexist at 0 Celsius, 273 Kelvin, 32 Fahrenheit. That substance is called ice water. Right? Now, if you have a good, uh, if you have a good thermos, okay, and you put some ice, a lot of ice in it, so you use crushed ice, you know, it's used, so that puts a lot more than ice cubes into your thermos, and then you fill up the rest with water, you'll have, if you have a good thermos, you'll have ice water through the day. Right? Because you're not getting heat in because it's a thermos. And the liquid water you pour in is going to melt a little bit of the ice that you, you know, you put the ice in first, then you fill up the rest with liquid water from the tap or from, you know, from a bottle of water like this. And that, the stuff that you pour in, it will melt some of that ice that you put in. All right? But it won't melt all of it. All right? And once it's melted a certain amount, its temperature goes from room temperature down to zero Kelvin, or to zero Celsius, 273 Kelvin, 32 degrees Fahrenheit. And then if it's, a, if, if, it's a, if it's a good thermos, it'll stay there. You won't lose much. And eventually it'll heat up, but you know, if it's a good thermos, it won't. Um, and so that whole process, ice and liquid can, um, exist at the same temperature and so they you know it, the water doesn't care it's perfectly happy to be liquid or ice if but only at that temperature so the whole idea is how do i get the ice to melt well you gotta you, you, you can't do it if you have a thermos you gotta have something else to zap it with some more calories of energy half a calorie for every gram of liquid ice of uh, water ice that you've got in there. You've got, it requires extra calories just to melt it. And then it's still at 32. Every gram of ice that melts, it's still at 32 because it's surrounded by ice, you know, until you get to the very last ounce, milli ounce, milligram of ice, and then you start, you know, then you've got all water, and then you start raising the temperature of the water at one calorie per gram. Now, go ahead and jot down this table. Um, and it's, we're, we're going to, I'm going to ask you a few little questions here with the clickers. And uh, we'll try to finish here the next minute or two. So we got some substances. You know, freezing point, specific heat. So for, for H2O, the specific heat of the solid is 0 0.50 calories per gram Kelvin. Now for copper, it's a lot smaller. It's only 0 0.0923. And for aluminum, it's 0 0.215. So aluminum is a little tougher to heat up than copper. But copper has a higher melting point, so... You know, melting point for, for H2O is 273, and for aluminum it's 933. So jot those down. Let me ask you one more. This will probably be the last question of the day. Let's try to do... So get these all jotted down, okay? And let me ask you about water, copper, and aluminum. Gram for gram, which is easier to heat up? No. Does one of your neighbors have it? 
I told you to write them down. Twenty seconds to vote. All right, I'll go back. Okay, you slackers. Specific heat. You only had three numbers to copy. Gosh. All right, here's your question. A, B, or C. Ten seconds to vote. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. Uh, let's see. Yeah, you guys did good. Uh, answer is copper. Now, hold on a second. Before we go, uh, I'll just, just dismiss you pretty close. Um, here's that same table. Uh, I'm going to ask you a little bit of homework, tiny homework assignment tonight, uh, probably with this table or something like it. All right. You're dismissed. I'll see you on Thursday.